Today is Thursday, March 11, 2021. As we hop into spring, the weather is cloudy with a high of 70 and a low of 54. Finally, some weather that isn't freezing cold. Spring is on its way, and that means daylight savings is upon us. Remember to move your clock forward an hour this Sunday, March 14th. The COVID-19 pandemic has created worldwide lockdowns and has altered the way we live. Worldwide, over 118 million people have been infected by the virus. As these numbers have increased, many businesses and industries have been closed or negatively affected. These closures have not only affected businesses, but also schools. An estimated 114 million students have been disrupted by COVID-19. Over the last couple of months, schools have begun to open back up, but not without issue. One noticeable dilemma is high school sports. With today's news, we go to the fields, track, and courts to discover how the recent pandemic has affected sports. With the recent change of scheduling from hybrid to four days a week, many changes have been made to academic learning. However, this has also made a huge impact on another part of school life, athletics. With more students present during the school hours, groups such as the football team must be extra careful during practice. One student testing positive could mean less players allowed to come to practice and potentially impact the season. Strength and conditioning coach King shared his knowledge and views on current procedures. One precaution is the six foot rule. We try to, to create that in everything we do. Let's try to keep six feet and we have to wear these everywhere. If you're in the weight room or you're in the turf room, you're wearing your face mask. And one aspect of the schedule change, I think it happened just a little bit too, too early because we were starting to get this thing under control. And the four day is gonna kind of throw everything out of whack a little bit. Also for athletes, they're used to going to school two days a week and then training and doing whatever else their extracurricular activities. Now they're gonna to go to four days a week with school and then their extracurricular activities. I think it'll affect them as far as their energy level and focus level because their days are starting to turn longer instead of shorter. And I believe there's gonna be a lot more homework done at night instead of throughout the day. Of course, some teams are currently in their game season, such as lacrosse. They have very similar approaches to safety during an active season. They share how the new changes also balance between student safety, student education, and curricular programs, such as sports being able to continue. Lacrosse coach Cox shared these insights. Well, all the athletes have to wear a mask into the stadium and outside the stadium. Anytime they're on the sidelines, masks are used. When uh, actual contact or during a game, they don't have to wear a mask. Um, we do use, we ask daily questions, we take temperatures, we use hand sanitizer. We just try to stay as socially distanced as possible when warming up, but then once the actual practice begins, then there is close contact. I would say the return to four days a week is positive for the students in that there is more of a learning environment and students can be more social. I think it could have a negative impact on athlete, athletics since we have only been at school one full day and we already had students who've had to quarantine due to social distancing. In the end, the change needed to happen. Adjustments are also necessary as we work through this together as a school. Our main priority, of course, is education but the athletic program is still highly valued by our school. Our final views come from Mr. Jones himself. So if your viewers can uh, know anything or learn anything, if you're waiting on a test result for COVID, you've already been tested, do not come to school while you're waiting on that test. Uh, once you get that test, that at least keeps you out of the building while you're waiting on that test. Once you get that test, if it says that you're positive, let the school know. Immediately once we know, we then go into contact tracing. But when it comes to sports, period, if you uh, have been following uh, the recommendations of the Shelby County Health Department, uh, as well as CDC sports, those, that's one of the things, just to be honest with you, that they've asked that you not do during COVID. But if you're going to do it, these are the recommendations that they gave us. So we've been following them. Uh, we've been keeping them down, uh, cases in terms of coronavirus, very uh, low, very minimal. Uh, not saying that we have not had people to get COVID, that has happened. Uh, but it's been minimal uh, based on some of the protocol that we have been following. Well, sports are still going by their same thing. It's the same kids that are still playing the sports. The four day a week really impacts us more um, in the classroom setting. 
So sports, four day a week, that didn't really impact sports. We're still doing the, following the same protocol. The number of students that are, um, that are on your team, that has not changed. So four day a week does not impact you. What impacts you is when now you go out into the classes. Many don't like the recent changes, but we acknowledge that it was a necessary action. Compromises have to be made continuously. But does that mean sports will ever have to go? Honestly, we're just going to have to wait and see. Reporting for CHS. While the coronavirus has severely impacted sports, it has also impacted much more pressing aspects of schooling. Have your grades been slipping? Well, you may not be alone with this struggle. In order to keep infection risks low, many schools have had to switch to hybrid and virtual learning programs. This switch has led to severely unintended consequences. Most notably is a slip in student ability to retain information and maintain a solid GPA. As you know, grades are one of the most important, if not the most important, component in high school. Steady grades are a student's key to accessing a rewarding academic future. Especially with the growing number of careers that require a college education, these grades need to be carefully achieved and maintained in order to maximize success. In the next segment, we will look into how students and educators are dealing with COVID-19 and its numerous effects on grades. Due to the COVID-19 virus and its many restrictions, students' grades and high school experiences have been severely altered in last years. There's a lot of ways that um, obviously the experienced students and teachers have this year. It's very different in the classroom because of COVID-19. Students have been personally affected by these changes. Since virtual learning began, it's been harder to focus on my classes. Uh, since I'm sitting in my own room uh, every day, there are so many more distractions around me that I have to worry about ignoring. So ultimately, I've been able to keep up with the curriculum, but it definitely was a battle. Teachers would also agree that COVID has severely impacted grades. So COVID, but with the grades, like you see a lot of kids are doing really well and a lot of kids are doing really poorly, but there's not much in between. Um, and that's probably because kids are at home or they're in person and assignments have to be accessible for both. So they may be a little bit easier and so kids are doing well, um, but if they're not doing either of them, then they're having lower grades as well. So less middle ground, but more high grades and more very low grades. Not only teachers, but students too. COVID has impacted grades by making it harder on students who can't really focus well on their own, which makes it harder for them to keep up a good grade average. But what are the solutions? So for solutions to that, I'd say there has to be some sort of like standardization. Um, it's really hard to do because I don't think it's fair when kids have to come in here and take tests and then kids at home get to take the same test because kids at home can obviously cheat like kids in here can't. So that's not really equitable. So there has to be some sort of like standardized method. Um, and that's what we're seeing as a challenge. So solution wise, um, maybe time limits or lockdown browsers or anything like that is what I would say. A solution I can see with grades is for those students who can't really focus well to be in a classroom setting. But the administrators are trying to find a solution. students have made a lot of strides to make learning as normal as possible while staying safe and the changing uh, restrictions that we have to fall under. Some feel that restricted learning brings forth new and more difficult challenges than before. The hardest challenge is having the possibility of having an internet connection loss or missing assignments or getting distracted too easily. Even teachers have had a hard time adjusting to this new restricted form of education. Um, so helping people has become a lot harder, a lot more of a challenge. Um, connecting face-to-face -face with someone is always much easier than it is technology-wise. Um, and also kids at home, virtual students, they generally don't ask as many questions, so I can't see what they're struggling with. Like what we were working on today in here, I could walk around, and even if somebody didn't ask a question, I could see if they needed help. Um, and you can stop and help them, but at home you can't really do that. Um, and also generally people at home, when they ask a question, it's asked after the fact. And so you have to revisit something, but you have to set up a Teams meeting to do that. So it's like sort of taking time out of everybody's day to go back, and it's just harder to connect virtually. Though it may be surprising to hear that teachers are also struggling with this restricted learning, administrators have also showed concerns that they feel. Um, just adjusting, obviously, to the online piece. And, and for teachers, really, it's also teaching to two separate, almost types of classrooms at a time. 
um, and the ways that you effectively teach kids in person might be very different than the way you effectively engage and teach, and teach kids uh, online. And so I know early on that was a struggle for them. For kids, I imagine it's the exact same thing, where it's probably tougher to engage with something that's online as opposed to sitting in a room with a real teacher there. Um, so I imagine that's probably the first and biggest hurdle. While COVID has impacted our grades, it has also led to adjustments in our day-to-day -day experience. With the school's attempt to switch to a four-day in-school learning program, some changes have to be made in order to keep the student body safe. One of these changes was the implication of study skills. As many of you, as many of you know, study skills has reduced the amount of time students and teachers have had to eat their lunch. Though some may disagree with these changes, they have been put in place for a very important reason. For for a very important, what? Over the last couple of years, drone technology has vastly improved and has flown its way into other industries. One such industry is law enforcement. You heard me right, those who protect and serve have taken to the skies. The Collierville Police Department is officially using drones to innovate its methods for carrying out their duties. This opens new and innovative, op innovative opportunities for police officers and public servants to protect and watch over Collierville like never before. What was the driving factor in the acceptance of the remote drone? Let's take a look at how these drones are being implemented. Yeah, I think the, the, the driving factor in the acceptance of the drone is the fact that we were able to leverage technology that will make uh, the jobs of our first responders safer and more efficient. And so uh, also we were able to identify an outside funding stream that allowed us not to have to use our internal budget. Could you give a short description of what the drones might look like? Well, um, uh, the, the one that we have uh, is, a, is a little bit larger drone. It's, uh, if I, I guess it, the best way to describe it is it, it looks like it's, uh, it's got propellers very similar to a helicopter, if you will, on four corners. And uh, it's pretty compact, uh, but it's, it's got a lot of capability. It's got the energy capability. Um, it's got a, a flight time of about 30 minutes, uh, and then we swap out batteries and send it right back up. What are some of the things that the drones can do that regular police officers can't do? Well, one, thing that the, one of the things that the, that the drone can do is give us uh, an aerial advantage. We're able to pull aerial data um, to allow the officers to, particularly uh, like in a search situation, they can search ground a lot faster and a lot more efficient and not be exposed to the hazards that are on the ground. And so you still will need the police officer, but it makes their job much more efficient and much safer um, for them to be able to see whether it's a lost child in a remote area uh, or whether it's in a hazmat situation. If we had an overturned tanker and we don't want to push our people into a hot zone, we can fly the UAS system, which is unmanned aerial system, into those hot zones and be able to give us real-time situational awareness. How are the drones being paid for? Drones are paid for through the CARES Act funding, and the very first mission that the drones uh, were assigned to was to provide uh, aerial views of the COVID vaccination site here in Collierville that we're doing, Collierville, Germantown, Boynton. And so exactly what we wrote our investment justification, the very first mission, uh, was able to support that event, and, and it allowed us to see uh, from very high ground traffic flow patterns, um, any other potential threats to the site and, um, and, and again covered a lot of territory that it would take a long time for officers on the ground to cover. What training and selection process is in place to be able to pilot the drones? The officers go through a two-week training program and then they also have to go and obtain their FAA license to, to fly drones and so all of our operators now are, are pilots are certified through the FAA. How much do they cost the police department? current system that we're operating is 24,500 in that in that range approximately. How would the drones affect the Collierville community? Well, one thing it does is it makes uh, the first responders uh, more efficient. It makes it safer for them. It allows us to provide better customer service uh, because we have an additional capability that we didn't have before. Have these specific drones been used anywhere else to your knowledge? A model was modeled after a program that uh, the Bartlett Police Department has in place today. Um, and so we modeled our program after this. 
very efficient. They come out here and supported us on operations that we've had, and um, and so we, we ours is um, just the, the newer version, same model. How long has the police station as a whole been thinking about buying these drones? Well, we're, we're in a constant state of assessment. We're always looking for ways uh, to leverage technology that will make our our job safer, more efficient. And uh, so it was part of the technology review uh, since early in the year, early 2020. What have you had to do for the drones to get approved for the use of police? Well, first we wanted to make sure that the, 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 the board and the mayor of Alderman were aware, well aware of the situation uh, of what we were trying to do with uh, the operational issues with the UAS system. Uh, we also had to develop general orders and policies that, that govern so that uh, you know that we're accountable, so that we're following all the state and local regulations, meeting all of our accreditation requirements. And so it was a very lengthy process, and so there's a lot of levels of accountability in there because uh, we want to make sure that we're transparent and we're open to the public so that they can see exactly how we use the equipment. Have these drones been approved for just the police, or have there been other first responders that have been approved to use them? No, well, the drones are approved. Uh, the team is made up of Carville police officers and firefighters, and so we have we have one firefighter that's uh, the, police, uh, the fire department is set up in shifts, three shifts, basically that are working. So there's always a fireman, that's a pilot that's trained its own. Uh, so it's a joint venture between uh, the Carville police department and the Carville fire department. How were these specific drones chosen for the job? Primarily from recommendations from other police departments around the country that had used them and then our officers were able to also be a part of uh, part of the police department's uh, program and see what's going on there and, and uh, actually get a, a first-hand look at them and see their capabilities. After all that, I leave with a word of inspiration. In the great words of Bill and Ted, remember to be excellent to each other. That's all I have today, folks, and we here at Newsbeat 19 want to wish you an excellent week.